Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to welcome those of you who are in attendance to our safety forum for tonight, and I also want to welcome those of you who are watching us online. I also want to make you aware that at the end, there'll be an opportunity for those online to ask any questions they may have after the presentation, as well as those folks that are in attendance. I want to recognize our Board of Education member, G. Marchand, in attendance, and of course, we have all our administrators here tonight as well. From time to time, we put on these forums, and in light of the Uvalde tragedy, we thought it would be appropriate to revisit all the security measures that we do have in place, the ones that we can share with you tonight, along with all the supports that we have in place for the students that attend each day. The Board of Ed has always made safety a priority, and for a number of years, uh, they have always dedicated a certain uh, segment of their budget to support new initiatives related to enhancing our security that we have in place. As you know, there's always that fine balance between creating a fortress and a school environment, and I believe we've been able to strike a good balance between the two where students feel safe, they have an opportunity to um, feel supported, and parents know that they're sending their children somewhere where they're going to be overlooked and uh, not overlooked, excuse me, and, and secure. Um, most recently, we received a $609,000 multimedia security grant. And that is going to be used in, uh, for a variety of items that will allow us to communicate with emergency personnel. And, and we have some folks in attendance tonight that will be presenting to you. The first uh, person that will be presenting will be Ted Optenbrow. Ted was a former police officer in Coventry for 23 years. He served on the force. The last couple of years on the force, he was actually our liaison between the police department and the Board of Education. He did an outstanding job, and when he retired, um, we were fortunate to have him come on board, and he has done an excellent job. And then also presenting tonight will be Christian Marcinczyk, who is our assistant principal at the middle school. And although she's at the middle school, she is our district-wide expert on bullying investigations, and she often supports administrators in other buildings when a need arises, and she also, in some cases, will conduct the investigations herself. So she'll be reviewing that process, along with the social-emotional learning supports that we have in place. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Ted Optenbrow, who will be uh, starting out our presentation. And before Ted gets going here, I want to make you aware that we're going to try to keep the presentation between 30 and 40 minutes to give everyone an opportunity to ask any questions that they may have. If you have any questions, you could please submit them into the chat online, and Jeff Spivey will be able to answer any of those questions for you, and then any parents who are in attendance tonight, we're happy to answer any questions, of course, live and in person here. So thank you again for being here, and uh, again, we look forward to continuing this conversation as well if needed. Thank you, Dr. Patron. Okay, so I'm gonna go over some security updates with everybody that are in place to help keep our students and staff safe. The first thing I'd like to talk about tonight is our Securely Auditor and Securely 24 program. And what this is, is an electronic monitoring program that's on all of our students' Chromebook devices, any of their electronic devices that they use that are provided by the school. So the first piece of this we're gonna talk about is the Securely Auditor. And what this is, is it uses AI to scan emails, documents, and drives in real time. And what it's looking for are particular words or phrases put together um, that it'll, it'll pick up on. Uh, if it picks up on something, it's gonna provide an alert based on the context. Um, it delegates the people who receive the alerts, so it's school specific. If it, it's a student at the middle school, uh, the administration from the middle school will receive the alert. I receive an alert. Um, the, some of the councils will receive alerts so that we can look into it further. All auditor hits are looked into, uh, and they're all, uh, it'll be determined whether there is merit for further investigation or whether it's benign in nature. Uh, these work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If it's the weekend and a student's doing a project or if the student's on their, their, their Chromebook and they look something up, um, we'll get the alert over the weekend also. Uh, so basically what that looks like is We'll get an email with the content, with the keyword or the phrase, and then uh, we'll call the student down and talk to them about it. A lot of times with our auditor hits, what they end up being are school projects that students are working on. So maybe the, the students are working on a project on, on suicide. We'll, we'll receive quite a few hits on suicide. We call the students down, they say, yes, we're doing a project on teen suicide in this class, and we know that it's a benign hit. 
So that's how the auditor works. The next piece of the Securely program is called Secure, Securely 24. It works in conjunction with the auditor, um, but it's going to take it a step further. So highly trained specialists analyze the flagged activity, and they perform a risk assessment to identify the concerning trends or patterns. When an alert is deemed urgent, they follow up with an escalation process to notify the school. Um, identifies uh, critical situations, act of violence, bullying, self-harm, things of that nature. Uh, when eminent action is needed, an analyst will contact uh, staff members based on the list that we provide, and then we, re we will look into it. If it's a, a hit over the weekend, we can also work with the police department to assist us with that investigation. So Securely 24, um, we're talking more about um, items of self-harm, bullying, uh, things of that nature that, that need to be addressed immediately. So how does Securely 24 work? A student's on their, their uh, district-issued electronic device, um, and they create uh, a hit for, for Securely 24 to look into. Uh, it's first analyzed by IA uh, when it's deemed suspicious then it actually goes to a human being who's going to now review this, okay? These people on the Securely 24 team receive special uh, training on how to investigate these types of uh, alerts. The Securely 24 team investigates to determine if the threat is imminent, what kind of time frame they're looking at, if it's something where they need to act immediately with a phone call, if it's something where they have to act immediately with a text message, or if it's something that they can send a, uh, an email out for follow-up um, at a later time. Uh, action is taken based on the investigation. Uh, I touched on this already, but the immediate uh, notification of the police department and or school occurs when uh, a threat is considered eminent. If it's deemed non-eminent, non uh, it'll generate the email to the police or the school to follow up with at a later time. The next thing I'd like to talk about is our Say Something program. What our Say Something program is, is an anonymous tip line or anonymous tip center where students can give information in regards to school safety that we can follow up on and they can stay anonymous. So they're a little more willing to, to file a tip if they know that they can stay and remain anonymous. Uh, the Say Something program, if anybody in the room is familiar with uh, Project Sandy Hook, Project Sandy Hook is an organization that was started by uh, family members, survivors whose children uh, were unfortunately killed in the, uh, the, the Sandy Hook school shooting. One of the things that they uh, started up with the Sandy Hook Promise was the Say Something program. So it teaches youth how to recognize warning signs and threats, especially in social media, from individuals who may be at risk of harming themselves or others and say something to a trusted adult, call 911, or use that tip line, okay? So there's a couple ways that we can submit a tip if a student uh, is concerned about a fellow student being bullied or the, the, themselves being bullied or they, they're concerned about an act of violence or somebody uh, maybe con considering self-harm. Um, they can file the tip using the app, which is simple to use. Um, the administrators, we've all uh, done test apps. Uh, test uh, runs with it. It's, it's a simple act to follow. Uh, they can use the website or the phone call, uh, place a phone call and actually speak to an operator at the call center. Uh, the call center is monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The people who work the call centers receive specialized training on how to uh, communicate with individuals to, to extract as much information as they can that can be used for the investigation down the road. Uh, the tip is managed by school administrators and police. Again, if it's after school hours, a lot of times the police will take the lead on it, um, working with school administrators. Uh, if it happens during school time, the administrators, we take the lead on it, and then we'll bring the police in if the police are needed. Every tip on Say Something is followed up with. One of the most common tips that we see on that app, uh, vaping, substance abuse, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, self-harm, like cutting, um, suicidal threat ideation, ide um bullying, cyberbullying, and then planned fights. You know, if they, if, a student hears that there's, there's some type of act of violence that may be occurring. Um, we've had very positive um, results with students using that, that uh, Say Something program to tell us about that. What are the overall benefits of the Say Something program? Educates on the signs and signals, especially on social media. It creates a well-informed school community. 
they feel comfortable uh, coming forward with that anonymous information for administration and law enforcement to follow up on. Uh, reduction in violence, suicide and cutting, bullying, drug use, and overall victimization. And then it, overall, it creates a, a safer, healthier school environment for not only uh, the students, but the staff also. Next thing I'd like to talk about, it, Dr. Patron touched on this briefly in his opening statement, is the uh, State of Connecticut Multimedia Grant that we were awarded this year. Uh, the awarded locations were the Coventry High School, Coventry Middle School, and the preschool. The multimedia grant is put on by the state of Connecticut. It sets aside $5 million for schools to per purchase in interoperable systems uh, that are capable of transmitting communications and notifications to law enforcement agencies and their call centers. So working with our dispatch center at the, at the police department. Uh, the goal is to make communication and information sharing between first responders and school schools as quick and seamless as possible. Um, some of the items that are covered under this type of grant are uh, cameras, radios, panic buttons, alarm systems, um, things of that nature. So I'd like to talk briefly about some of the, some of the uh, security uh, updates that we're gonna do with that grant. Uh, Coventry High School, um, I'm gonna speak about first, but before I get into that, uh, I wanted I wanted to say that uh, the cameras are an invaluable tool for us to use to um, investigate reports of bullying, reports of vandalism to the school, things of that nature. We, we can use those cameras um, for those investigations. They're very beneficial. So for the high school, we're looking at an addition of 17 high definition interior cameras to address some blind spots. And we're mainly talking about hallways with those 17 cameras. Um, this number includes five 180-degree cameras to provide co coverage in large capacity areas like the auditorium, the gymnasium, the cafeteria, and the media center. Um, as it stands today, we do not have coverage in those areas, so that, this is gonna be a significant upgrade for us. Uh, the addition of three high-definition exterior cameras to address blind spots on the exterior of the high school. At the middle school, we're adding five 360-degree exterior cameras and two 180-degree exterior cameras. Now, when I talk about the middle school receiving these cameras uh, for the exterior, that also includes the preschool area, the, the Hale Early Education Center. Uh, the addition of 360 degree cameras in the cafeteria and in the gymnasium at the middle school, and the addition of five uh, high definition interior hallway cameras. Also with the grant, we're gonna get a new updated, upgraded fire alarm and burglar alarm system, which has many enhanced features. And that's for the entire complex here, the high school, middle school, and preschool. Uh, Two-way radio for direct communication with law enforcement in the event of a crisis. Um, we felt that this was an area that we were lacking with a direct communication with the police uh, in the event of an emergency and the police department has been very good working with us um, as a team to try to, to, to overcome that deficiency. And then the last thing I'd like to talk about is the, the safety and security training that we're doing this year. Uh, this is an annual type of training that we do. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is our staff response to an active threat and lockdown training. Uh, this is a, a, a presentation that I do with staff. It's about a 30 minute presentation. Uh, the entire staff, including cafeteria staff, secretarial staff, custodial staff, everybody gets it. Um, it explains to them um, what to expect in the event of a crisis, um, ways to prevent warning signs, things like that. It's a very good program. Uh, the annual crisis drills, lockdown drills, the state of Connecticut requires that every school has a minimum of 10 crisis drills a year, seven of which have to be fire drills. Um, so when we train for our lockdown drills and our fire drills, uh, we, we take them seriously. The old um, military saying, how you train, you shall fight. We, we make uh, an impression with our teachers that, that that also applies to our our school here. So we take our drills very seriously so that in the event of an actual emergency, they're gonna revert back to that training. An annual uh, KERMA tabletop exercise, uh, we host that every year. The Board of Ed, uh, Coventry School District, hosts that for the town of Coventry. Kermit is our insurance provider, and what we do is we have Kermit come in and uh, they will present a, a crisis to the uh, administrators to the school, 
heads of departments for all the town of Coventry, town manager, uh, public works, fire department, police department, you name it, their, their heads are there. And we work through the problem over about two hours. We discuss how to get through this crisis. Uh, the Kerma security audit, uh, what we do is we make an arrangement with Kerma to come in on a specific date, once or twice a year. And what they're looking to do is figure out if they can get into a school without a key card access. Can they find a door that's open? If they get into the school and they're not badged, will staff challenge them? Uh, if they can find a classroom that's unsecured, is the computer left unlocked? Is it on? Are personal effects left lying around? Is there a purse, a wallet, things like that? They won't take the purse or wallet, they'll just take a picture of it, but if they take a picture, it's considered gone. So we do that a couple times a year to keep staff on their toes. They know that Kermit can always be showing up any day. And then the last thing is PMT training, which is uh, physical, psychological management training and techniques. So I'm the instructor for the district for that. We have a, a large number of staff members who are trained in PMT. They get an annual refresher. And what PMT teaches is how to de-escalate students that are in crisis. Um, what I always like to say is 99% of what they do is verbal de-escalation. Okay, we, we're always working towards that verbal de-escalation. It also does teach some protective holds. Absolutely. Okay, so for the 10 crisis drills for every school, uh, I participate in all the fire drills and the lockdown drills. Um, I also uh, facilitate uh, having a police officer at our, our lockdown drills, and they act as an evaluator. Um, for the fire drills, we have either the fire marshal, fire chief, someone from the fire department come, and they watch. From their unique perspective, they may pick up on something that we're missing. Um, they'll critique that feedback that they provide us with is put into play to make us stronger and better and safer. Thank you. Okay, good evening. I'd like to spend the next half of the presentation just... Ooh. It's off. It's off. Okay. Um, <laughs> discussing bullying preventative measures that we do throughout the Coventry Public Schools. Um, Coventry Public Schools has adopted Board Policy 513... 5131.7, and this policy enforces um, prohibiting bullying on and off school grounds. So students who are verified in acts of bullying are subjected to school discipline and potentially expulsion. And you can see based on the slide that when we talk about on and off school grounds, this could be a school-related event that's not necessarily Okay, that's not necessarily on school property, it could be a field trip, sporting event, um, and any of those um, qualify under our bullying board policy. When any allegations of bullying are brought forward or any other student concerns, we investigate them. Um, administration looks at them. We also have school climate committees um, that review these investigations. And many times these allegations can be considered general conflicts between students. But you can see, as noted in this slide, acts of bullying are often repeated, they're intentional, and they're threatening. And the bullying in these situations typically does not stop. So when staff parents or students report an interaction, they may, that may be considered as bullying, a investigation immediately begins. And this could be a formal complaint or an informal complaint. As soon as we receive one of these reports, we consider the safety of both the alleged victim and the perpetrator. And we act to make, to ensure the safety of all students involved. And this may include reassigning seats on a bus, in the classroom, at lunch, at their lockers. It could include delayed passing at the middle school or high school. There's various different scenarios, but these are some of the situations that we would consider to ensure that safety. This here shows our bullying report. This is a bullying form that a parent 
can fill out if there are um, allegations of a bullying case. And this information is very important to the investigation. Um, we use this information to verify acts of bullying. We use it to um, interview maybe potential witnesses. So this form um, is important. Once we receive an, a, bull a bullying report, we are required to notify uh, the alleged perpetrator's parent or guardian an investigation will begin immediately and often is completed within one to two weeks of receipt of the bullying report. If bullying is substantiated, um, we consider many of the next steps. We involve a lot of times our clinical team. We consider if remedial action is necessary. We consider if any disciplinary actions are necessary. And we consult with our school support staff, our counselors, our social workers, school psychologists, as if, if they deem counseling is necessary for the alleged perpetrator. In addition, once bullying cases are verified, parents or guardians of both the victim and the perpetrator are notified. We typically meet with both fam families individually, and we review the investigation and the outcomes. We often cannot re report disciplinary consequences due to confidentiality. However, we can discuss plans that are put in place to protect the victim. And also, it should be noted that once a student is verified as a bully, it remains on their record until they graduate high school, and it's also reported to the state of Connecticut. In Coventry, we take bullying seriously, and we put in place several preventative measures. Every school and district has a safe school climate committee, and this committee meets a few times a year. It's made up of administrators, teachers, parents, and the district security specialist, Mr. Optenbrow. The committee meets to promote positive school climate and address bullying concerns. In addition, as Mr. Optenbrow mentioned, we have the See Something, Say Something Act app, which allows students to anonymously report concerns of students in grades 5 through 12. And as Mr. Optenbrow mentioned, things such as bullying, potential fights, substance abuse are just some of the topics that do come forward. I also want to note that in students in grades K through 8 follow an SEL curriculum, um, which is social emotional learning. Um, these lessons provide students, the younger students, with lessons on how to apologize, how to ask questions, be respectful, um, as well as as the students move on throughout their educational career, bullying prevention is also covered as a specific topic. In the secondary grades of 9 through 12, um, students receive lessons throughout their advisory classes on self-management and relationship skills. Um, in addition, it should be noted that many of the schools are hosting assemblies throughout the school year that are raise awareness to bullying and its effects, internet safety, as well as drug awareness. And finally, Dr. Patron does meet regularly with students in all of the schools to hear firsthand what's going well and what are some of the student concerns. As I, as I mentioned when we started out, uh, I want to give folks an opportunity to answer questions. We could start with those who are in attendance, and then we'll pivot to those that are online. Uh, Mr. Spivey will be able to read the questions to us, and I'm sure the answers will benefit those who are in attendance as well. So with that said, does anyone have any questions that's in attendance? I know we have a few parents here. Sure, that's a good question, yeah. So when we, we had to go through specialized training for it, um, to their credit, they're very uh, strict about making sure we're going to fully commit to taking on uh, that program. And we had to go through, I think, two, to, two or three different sessions. I apologize, I don't remember exactly, but even I had to participate in that uh, as a superintendent because oftentimes on a weekend, I'll get an alert or I'll get a phone call. Um, as well as, as, as Ted Optebrow noted, the police get the first call because when it's related to student security or safety, 
we want to make sure that we're acting very quickly. And then the secondary call is to school administration, and usually I'm the one who gets that next call. <clears throat> but to answer your question, there's annual training that goes on to remind students how to use it, who have had, had exposure to it, and those who are brand new go through a little bit more of extensive training on how to use it. It's pretty, pretty user friendly and pretty straightforward. And they could do things anonymously and they could do it via text messaging or as uh, Mr. Optenbrow pointed out, you can also call if you wish. And as uh, noted earlier, the, the um, operator on the other end tries to extract as much information so that we can fully investigate it because sometimes they don't provide enough information and makes it hard for us to follow through. What we found to be most effective, and we pride ourselves on this, is we're fortunate to live in a, you know, a, a tight-knit community with smaller schools, and that allows us to have relationships with kids. And most of the information that we find out, uh, some of it comes through the Say Something app, you know, um, but most of it comes from someone feeling comfortable with an adult in the building and approaching that adult and letting them know, hey, this is gonna happen, or this happened in the bathroom, or you know, my friend is being bullied, or my friend is feeling depressed and they need help. And they can report that anonymous, anonymously as well, and then we can get them the help or support that they need. So that's where most of our information comes from, is, is having those relationships. And we do an exercise at each school where we list every student, and then we have staff go around and write underneath that student's name whether they have a connection with that student or not. And then I believe at the high school you did it in reverse, correct? You had the students list who they had a connection with in the school to just kind of validate that. And anyone, you know, there's, there's always a few students that may be missed, and those students that staff does not have a connection with, we made it a point to make sure that we're having some kind of contact with those individuals. Any questions from online, Jeff? Any other questions? Yes. You're only required to have like three, three per year? Yes, so this, we have to, there's 10 a year, as, as Ted pointed out, and seven of those, which you think it would be flipped, you think it would be seven lockdown drills and three fire drills, because I think the last time a school fire occurred, there was an issue, it was 1956? 58. 58, sorry, 58, I'm two years off. So what we do is we try, to, we, we try to drill into them that wherever you are, go into the closest classroom. And that's what we really try to stress to them. Do not go all the way, if, if um, you all know, use GHR for example, if the, the student is in third grade and they said, oh I forgot something um, in Ms. Spazzato's art room, which is way down the other end, I need to bring this back to her, I walked out with it by accident, and they're way down the other end, they don't need to come back to their classroom, <clears throat> excuse me. We want them to go to the closest classroom. If they're halfway down to fourth grade hall, look to your left and right and go to that closest classroom. Yeah, teachers. Yep. And then also part of that, as, as that announcement comes through, that's, that's also a point because all the doors are locked immediately. Um, this isn't anything we, we have an issue sharing. Every single teacher in the district has a key that'll work on any of the doors in any of the buildings. So for example, if Christian Marcinczyk is down at CGS, and we go into a lockdown drill, and she's walking down the hallway with a student. She could take that student into a room, and she has the ability to lock that classroom herself um, from inside. Not from the outside, but from inside. Yeah? So, so the question is, how do we qualify for the multimedia grant? I should have repeated the other question that you asked, I apologize. Uh, how do we qualify for that? So one of the main things that we have to submit to the state every year is, a, um, I'm blanking on the name, it's an all, all hazard plan. I was gonna say all emergency plan, but it's an all hazards plan. And we have to go through and do a comprehensive uh, analysis of our system as a whole and put our plan together and then uh, I think there's probably 20 signatures on there possibly. I sign off on it, the town manager signs off on it, all emergency personnel sign off on it, Ted Optenbrow signs off on it, and it just shows the state that we have a plan in place in the event of emergency. And also our administrators went through specialized training as well, which allows us to effectively communicate with emergency personnel so that we're all speaking the same language. 
because that's what we found can impact school systems sometimes or any operation when you're speaking two different languages. Uh, you know, they're speaking their, what would be called their jargons maybe possibly, and then, you know, we don't understand that because you know, we're in the ed world. So now we understand what that communication needs to look like and we're all quote unquote speaking the same language. So part of that was making sure we had that plan in place, also demonstrating a need um, and part of the, uh, the need for this was our ability to upgrade our systems and be able to communicate with emergency personnel. So we couldn't put in something like ballistic film on the windows, which we've done before, which we have and we've done before. It needed to be something, the things that need to be included in this grant needed to allow us to be able to communicate with emergency personnel. So um, I can't remember if it was the, the security grant round three or round four, but I wrote in there um, for our police department to be able to access our cameras from their patrol cars. Um, and the last go around as well, they have a, I think it's an 80 inch monitor that is up in the dispatch center at the police department that is constantly um, cycling through all our different cameras as well. Um, there's other things that we have in place. Uh, Ted alluded to the fact that we're upgrading our alarm system here. There's other features or functionality of that system that uh, will absolutely support our emergency personnel in the event of emergency, but again, can't go into too much detail on that. But that's a good question. And unfortunately, uh, the, I know you didn't ask this, but we did submit for a fifth round of the security grant and uh, we, our luck ran out. We got the first four rounds and the fifth round we didn't get. Uh, and the fourth round actually, more detail than you probably want, we got actually half of what we had asked for because that pool of money's running out. I believe it's the uh, uh, tobacco money that may be being used for some of that. We can, if there's a sixth round, we absolutely will submit. Uh, we're, we're always looking for ways to do things without impacting the taxpayers. And I, I feel very comfortable saying we probably received a few million dollars in um, grant funding to support security. Bob, would that be fair to say? Yeah. And Bob is our, our finance director, so he's, you know, yeah. And like I said, just the first four rounds that I wrote up on that, we got quite a bit of money, and this most recent grant was for $609,000. So again, all these great things that we'll have in place um, that are not impacting the taxpayers, or obviously, and that obviously means the Board of Ed's budget. Um, I feel really good about where we are, and I, I hate to bring up a, sad subject, but when the Newtown tragedy occurred 10 years ago, many districts were scrambling to put certain things in place, like for example, you know, badge access to get in and out of buildings, uh, the person traps, which is, for those who've been in our school system, you know, you enter one set of doors, and then before you can access the second set of doors, they're looking to see who's there, what you have on you, do you have business to be in the building? Um, and uh, related to that, we had all those things already in place when other districts were scrambling to make that happen. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the number is now, but uh, we were at one point one of 66% uh, 66 of the districts that submitted that all hazards plan that I, uh, I talked about earlier. Um, another feather in our cap, which I like to highlight, and we talked about KERMA coming in, do those tabletop exercise, which includes all town uh, personnel, emergency personnel, as well as district personnel. Um, KERMA said they put us in the top 10% of all schools in the state of Connecticut as far as what we do annually uh, without fail to make sure we're keeping kids safe. And you know, and honestly, you know, as, as a parent myself, you know, you wanna make sure that you're sending your child somewhere where they're safe. Um, and we want parents to feel confident, you know, putting their child on the bus or dropping them off at school. Um, I know I, I do as, as a dad. And uh, so we want parents to feel the same way and we work hard at that. Um, you know, we're not perfect and we're always learning and refining and trying to get better at what we're doing. Definitely working hard at it. Any questions online? Dr. Patron, if someone joined late, will the presentation in its entirety be available via YouTube? Great question. So tonight's uh, presentation is being recorded. Uh, you can access it on the Board of Education website, um, and that link will be there. And you'll find it under the Board of Education tab. Any other questions online? Will the climate survey results be shared? Curious about student perceptions of feeling safe at school. 
So what could be shared uh, through that data will be shared. There, there's no, um, not trying to hide any of that information. If we don't know what's going on, we can't get better at it. Um, so we're hoping that students uh, will share that information and parents will as well. Uh, but what's always important to us is that it, it makes us aware of any weak spots that we have in our buildings, right? So a student may be very specific and say, hey, this back corner gets really crowded and a lot of kids get pushed around and we could potentially get hurt. So what can we do to alleviate that? Um, this is the simple example. Any other questions from those folks sitting here? Yeah, it's okay. So the question was, are all the doors required to be locked during a school day? Absolutely, yes. Yep. All, all doors, right. And then just so you know, if a door is propped open, right, um, there is an alarm that goes off and it's, and it's loud. Um, and it's not a lot of fun. As a matter of fact, a coach said, oh yeah, I can, I can validate that. We, we tried to prop a door open and, uh, and a noise was, was pretty ear piercing. So we, we try to put those little things in place. We, you know, there's lots of details I could go over that we could publicly share that um, wouldn't be an issue, but that, that's a great question. So all those doors should be secured. We have cameras on all the doors. We have staff that is on hall duty um, that walks around and, and checks for things like that. And then as Mr. Optenbrow um, discussed earlier, our police department, which is, is on campus a lot for, for just you know, high visibility when they can be, and sometimes they'll get out of a patrol car and walk around the building themselves. Or, or like we said, we have Kerma come in and Ted just went over it very quickly, but we, they have a, a younger staff that comes in that some could pass for a high school student. So they'll get in the building, they'll say, hey, we're from Kerma. We'll say, hey, Kerma's coming to visit this day to the secretarial staff. And then when they walk in the building, only one person will show up in the office and the other person will try and walk through the school and see if they get detected. Um, so we do a lot of little things like that, that, um, you know, keep us on our toes and make sure people are doing what they're supposed to do. But, uh, you know, we, we, like I said, you know, we've learned a lot over the years, sadly, through some of these tragedies and we've, we've made those adjustments. And, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, Ted was the liaison when he was on the police department and he always did a great job of keeping us up to date and he provided training as a police officer before, um, he came on board with us. Any questions online, Jeff? Any other questions from parents in attendance? No? I'll give those folks online just a, another minute and then we could wrap up unless someone here has questions. No? Sometimes it takes a little bit to type those questions in, so I'll give them a minute if you don't mind. While we're, waiting, while, we're, while we're waiting another minute or so here, you know, one thing that I do want to point out um, is, you know, years ago, it used to be a bad thing if the police department were on campus. And uh, we worked really hard over the last decade to develop a strong relationship with our police department. Um, Chief Palmer, who, as you know, retired, um, has done an excellent job of supporting us over the years. Just an, an amazing job of letting his police officers know that they are welcome on campus anytime. I made that very clear that they are welcome here any time that they would like if they want to just sit in our parking lot, if they want to walk around our schools. I also started, um, I opened up accounts. Uh, it's not taxpayer money, it's my money. Um, there's, there is an account at every single school that allows a police officer to come into our school, have lunch with the kids, walk around, have a snack, have whatever they want, um, and they just enter the, the code into that account, which I won't tell you because I don't want everybody uh, getting ice cream on me. but. Uh, you know, they come in quite a bit to have lunch with the kids. You know, the pandemic put a pause on that, but uh, you know, now that we're opening back up, they're back in our buildings, which is a good thing. But I will tell you, you know, 10 years ago, I used to get a dozen calls in, to my office that folks would say, hey, the police are at the school, what's going on? I'm worried about that, and rightfully so, I get that. But now they're so visible um, that I, I don't get any calls anymore, that people just know this is just what it is to, to keep people safe. and. Um, you know, we want them to kind of rotate through the schools. They show up on opening day. They're welcoming kids on the first day of school. 
You know, they'll come and just walk around the school just to say hello and see how things are going. Um, they're often at fire drills and lockdown drills, so the kids see them all the time so they feel comfortable. They don't feel scared when they see a police officer, and that's important. Um, and they've done an excellent job, and, you know, kudos to Jeff Spajinski, who is um, the acting chief right now. He's done a great job of supporting us um, as Mark uh, retired, and he's done a great job working with um, Ted as well. Yes? Yes, absolutely. And they, they also, I can't go into a lot of detail, but they, there's um, measures in place in the event of emergency that give the police a direct advantage. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, in the event that they need to ha gain access to our buildings, they're often part of our drills, as I mentioned already. They go through training. As a matter of fact, I think it's this summer, correct? They're going to they're gonna be in our buildings uh, going through training. For those of you who are... Um, who pay attention to these kind of things. We have a lot of new police officers, which is a good thing. You know, we, we hate to lose our, our officers who have been part of the community for so long, but we do welcome our new officers. And these folks want to get familiar with our buildings, and they should. So we're going to be running drills and just exercises in here over the summer um, to get them acclimated to the buildings as well. And Ted does a lot of that work. And again, I can't go into any detail, but you know, they, they understand what our buildings look like in the event of a in the event that there's an emergency, they'll, they'll know where things are. Any other questions online? Are efforts being made to improve security through grant money at CGS and GHR? So that's a great question. So are any efforts being made to enhance the security at GHR and CGS? And the answer is yes. As a matter of fact, the fourth round of the security grant that was awarded to the district was focused solely on the K-5 schools. I included the middle school and high school, and for whatever reason, they decided to just fund the um, CGS and GHR enhancements and work as well. So yes, they got the entirety of the fourth round of that grant, along with the first uh, three rounds of that grant as well. They also benefited from that grant. So when I write a grant for that, and um, I always include all four schools. Um, really technically six schools if you count our 18 to 22 year old program and our preschool any other questions from online no mr marchand sure um christian what was it I, you, you had the numbers is it one so far at cgs correct and Two or three at GHR, five at the middle school. Sorry, three at the middle school, and uh, do we have any at the two at the high school? None. None. Okay. So very very low numbers, but you know I I, I do want to point this out. You know when we talk about bullying, and Christian touched on this. If someone reports a bullying incident, and you know I'll just use myself and Ted as an example, and and there's a report that I'm bullying Ted. Okay. It may not be a verified act of bullying as defined by the state of Connecticut, but that does not mean that nothing is being done. It doesn't mean that consequences aren't being issued to me as a student. It doesn't mean that my parents aren't being contacted to address that behavior. It doesn't mean that it's not being documented so that it does happen again. There's that history piece there as well. So the numbers are very low, um, but the state has specific guidelines related to what would be a verified act of bullying. So if it doesn't fit into that definition, again, it doesn't mean that nothing's being done. The challenge is, is that, and this was touched on tonight, we can't share that information as far as what the consequences are for that other student who may be the aggressor. And you know, I, I go back to my days as a principal or even an assistant principal, and when I would call to say a particular incident occurred, and I get it, you know, as a parent myself, I understand this. The first question, or at least the second or third question that a parent would ask, well, what's gonna happen to that other child? And I get that it's frustrating that we can't share that information, but it, it's, again, a, a confidentiality issue, and legally we can't share that information because it would be the equivalent of sharing a student's record. And, you know, the other side of it too, and most parents understand this, is they wouldn't want us to discuss their child with another parent either, right? So that's the other part of it, just to put it in, in basic terms, you know, we can't be discussing, it would be inappropriate to do that. 
But again, it doesn't mean nothing is being done. I, I can assure you, you know, being privy to what occurs in the district, that if there's inappropriate actions happening, um, you know, we do take action on it. It may, you know, um, but it, and it follows a logical ladder of consequences, right? You don't want to go from zero to 100 sometimes unless the behavior warrants that. Any other questions online? I'm just getting clarification on one. Sure. So the question is, can you share alleged reports versus verified acts of bullying in terms of the frequency or results? Not so, necessarily specific. So legally, we only need to report the verified acts of bullying. We need to keep a log of the verified acts of bullying. Beyond that, we don't, we don't keep a record other than what is put in that other student's disciplinary file, if appropriate. So it goes back to what I just discussed. If I'm an aggressor, I may not, and, and it's reported that I'm bullying Ted, for example, uh, it may not rise to the level of a verified act of bullying, but if I'm issued a suspension or detentions or any other kind of communication, that becomes part of my file. And so that information cannot be shared. But any verified acts of bullying are reported to the state, as already been discussed, and there's a record kept at the school. They, they keep track of that data as far as how many, they keep track of a lot of data actually. <laughs> they keep track of all of our out of school suspensions, they keep track of our in school suspensions, they keep track of our bullying, our verified acts of bullying, they keep track of our attendance data. Um, trying to think of any other data points that they keep. Those are the big ones. I may be missing one or two, but that's, that's the big ones. But they'll, they'll keep track of that verified act of bullying. So, so if we have an exorbitant number of suspensions or we have, a, you know, a, a number that would appear out of line for the verified, verified acts of bullying, sometimes the state may step in and say, we need you to put a plan together to reduce that number. So this wasn't the case in Coventry, although we took it on as, as an initiative, but as a result of the pandemic, a lot of students, what they call disappeared. Uh, especially in the bigger urban districts. So in other words, they went remote and just didn't check in online, didn't check in in person, obviously. They just kind of dropped off the radar. So the, the chronic absenteeism, which is 10 or more unexcused absences, uh, was shot through the roof as far as the number of um, students that qualified under that, that identification. So the state put a big initiative together to help reduce that chronic absenteeism. So we took on that initiative because we had a little bump in our, our chronic absenteeism as well to address that. But related to what you talked about, that would be an example of we had, you know, I'm gonna make this up, 50 verified acts of bullying. The state would come in and say, hey, time out, what are you doing? Why are these numbers so high? Explain to us what's going on. And if they feel it's necessary, they may require us to put a plan together to reduce that number or put some programs or measures in place or they may do an audit and say, well, well, what are you doing exactly? And we could say, well, here's what we're doing. And they may say that's not enough. Do you feel like sometimes you're not considering bullying, like you don't get audited and you have No, I mean, there's no, we don't have anything to hide. There's no threshold. I wouldn't even know what the threshold was to try um, to avoid. And, you know, we've been cited in the past, you know, as other districts, sometimes there was a big initiative, I want to say probably 15 years ago, um, with reducing the number of out-of-school suspensions. So that was a big initiative, and we were, I think, in the red 15 years ago in that area. So we had to put some initiatives together, along with, I think, the majority of districts in the state of Connecticut were, and it eventually passed a law which requires us to, only in extreme cases, put someone in out-of-school suspension um, but first step would be in-school suspension, and then if they violate that, then you could go to out-of-school suspension. But anything that's reported, we have an obligation to investigate. And if parents don't agree with the outcome of that investigation, they could appeal that or ask for a second look at it. Mr. Spivey, any other questions online? Not, not right now. Any more questions from our folks in attendance? Yeah. No, oh, you have to be sorry. That 
That would be reported to the state. So the state would have that information um, if you ever wanted to look that up as far as the number of suspensions and things like that. All that's public record. Unless it's below 40, depending on what the date is. So let me clarify. Depending on what the data point is, if it's below 40 students, they consider that too identifiable. So depending on what it is. So it's, for example, if we had, um, you know, 35 out of school suspensions at the middle school, for example, they may not report that number because it's too identifiable. Any other questions? Uh, a parent wanted to point out that if anyone's interested, the number of suspensions by school are available at edsite.gov. Yep. You can find all the information there. But it is on the, is on the state site. Any other questions from our folks in attendance? Again, I really want to thank everyone for taking the time to be here, whether they're online or in person. And as we always try to stress to folks, if you have questions, or sometimes I always say this, is that people may not feel comfortable even asking questions online or in person. I'd urge you really to pick up the phone and call your building administrator, or you can call my office. I talk to parents all the time. You can email me if you're more comfortable doing that and we can set up a time to talk, uh, as the administrators are happy to do that as well. And if we don't know about something, we can't fix it, so I'd urge you, if you're hearing something, you're unhappy with something, you know, let's talk about it. That's the, really the only way to solve something. Um, I wanna thank, again, this is, gonna be, this is recorded, so if you wanna watch it again, if you liked it that much, you're welcome to do that. If you happen to miss it, tell your friends to watch it, and again, if they have questions, we're happy to answer any questions as well on that. So thank you, everyone have a great night. I wish you well, and everyone have a safe and happy summer.